Hi there. Well, today I'm going to try and turn some spalted beech I got from the Huendon Estate National Trust, um, which will eventually go back for sale at one of their craft fairs whenever lockdown allows us. So uh, it was in the field cut about a month ago, so it was quite wet, but it's been down for a while. So I'm going to, I think, do a hollow form of some description. Uh, this is the piece I've just put on the uh, on the lathe, uh, marked up the centres. I use my rather tired and broken round circle template to find the centre. Makes life very easy. 23 centimetres, 9 inches, and about the same in diameter. So um, I've just put it between uh, accents to crown drive uh, straight into the actual uh, headstock, um, which... Uh, will hopefully give me a good grip and um, get the mask on and get the pole garage out I think and uh, turn it around So with it roughly turned around, uh, just trim up the uh, bottom end and then mark up a uh, tenon. I'm going to use the large record power dovetail jaws that are about five inches across because uh, as I'm going to hollow this I need a pretty good um, gripping method otherwise uh, it'll either shear the tenon off or else just come off the lathe. So just use the feeler gauges to make uh, a mark on the bottom. Make sure you only use the uh, point nearest you to mark it and you eyeball the outer one. If you use the two at the same time, it gets exciting very quickly. Uh, so then just hob off some of the waste and uh, turn the tenon. I'm just hogging the material off here using the lower wing and the bottom part of the bevel of the 3 8 bowl gouge and then uh, trim the shape of the uh, tenon so that it's um, got the mortise profile using a skew. And I'm then just uh, getting rid of some more of the waste uh, on uh, this part. This will be the bottom. So I need to create a little flat area so that the um, face of the jaws has got something to sit against because that provides the majority of the support for the grip from your chuck jaws. And then before I put it in the uh, chuck jaws, time to just get rid of some of the waste on the headstock end and um, shape it up ready to swap over in a few minutes time. The wood is really quite punky and uh, isn't getting a good finish off the tool. It's um, chipping rather than shaving. So just trying a few, uh, maybe close to finishing cuts, uh, going round the uh, profile, smoothing it off again. Uh, it's, this is going to require quite a bit of work, I think, once it's in the chuck to get a decent finish. So we swapped over and put it in the chuck. Uh, looks like I got the size just right and it's giving a nice firm grip with those uh, really large jaws. So a bit more finessing of the shape and then start hollowing it out. Because it's so deep and some of the beach is actually really hard even though other parts of it are really punky 
Uh, I'm going to go down um, first of all with my 35mm carbide tipped uh, Axminster Excalibur, whatever it is, uh, Forstner, uh, to get a, um, the, the hole started. And then after that, I'm going to go down with a bigger, a bigger Forstner, so do it in stages. If you put too much pressure on a Forstner, uh, particularly as it's end grain, which is the hardest uh, part of the wood to cut, uh, you will be in danger of stressing the screw threads on your tailstock drive. So do it in stages. The carbides, I have to say, the carbide forceners are excellent. And even though it is end grain, they do cut really well. But this wood is very wet. So as you can see, we're creating steam, not smoke. Um, so you have to clear the bit quite regularly. Otherwise, it will clag. And if it clags and sticks... Uh, then you, when you try and pull your Forstner out, all it'll do is extract itself from your um, tailstock and you'll be stuck with your Forstner neatly embedded in a nice puree of wood in the middle of your um, turning piece. And don't ask me how I know that. Uh, somebody told me that it happens. I've never had that happen myself, of course. You know, I'm just telling you what I've heard. Well, time now for the big guns to come out. This is a, um, I don't know what it is, 55, 60 mil Forstner um, sawtooth. Just giving it a quick sharpen up with the diamond hone uh, and we're ready to go. But again, taking it easy and in stages. I'm running at around 450 RPM, uh, holding the um, Jacob's chuck to make sure that there isn't any potential for it to spin. Uh, and again, just taking it easy. Fortunately, this is a nice self-clearing bit with some good uh, some good gaps, but it does produce some steam. So after the Forstner has gone all the way down to the depth of the original 35 mil, um, I'm going to swap over and bore down to the base of the um, vessel with the 35mm. Uh, the uh, hole I've created with the big Forstner is big enough now for the body of the Jacob's chuck to actually go into the hole. So there is method to the madness. It means I don't have to use the extension bars, which I've got, but they do tend to make it a bit more uh, uh, insecure when you're boring the longer depths. So doing it this way works quite well. So just to prove what sort of claggy, puree, sawdusty mess you do get in the centre, uh, this is a shot from my new toy, an endoscope. Uh, got it uh, at the uh, Boxing Day sales of Amazon. Um, it's quite good fun, actually. You can stick it in all sorts of places that you probably shouldn't and see what's going on. I might even have a play in a little bit with it strapped to one of the tools. You can also see from those uh, endoscope shots what uh, terrible finish I'm getting off the tool from this uh, very punky wet wood. Anyway now, uh, I've done the 35mm hole so I'm going down all the way down now with the big one uh, to give me the hole right down to the base. So there we are, that's the hole cleared out uh, all the way down to the bottom. It's quite fun this gadget I must have it oh we can see the pip at the bottom uh, that's going to take a bit of removing okay so now to start the hollowing I've uh, got here a crown um, hollower with the articulating head and a carbide tip on it and I've strapped the end of the endoscope to it just for fun and we'll see how that works on showing the tool presentation well you can see how messy the inside of the hole is so I'm just going to turn the lathe on, there it is, uh, and do some uh, gentle uh, cuts uh, just to get used to this uh, tool, which I've not used this particular carbide before. So some gentle push and pull cuts, uh, gently rubbing the bevel. Seem to get the hang of it quite well, so uh, just apply a bit more lateral pressure. Can't apply too much because it's still, don't forget, just on the uh, tenon. And uh, yeah, soon start to hog out some material. 
So I thought I'd uh, swap now to the Simon Hope um, square bar carbide, which uh, is articulated at 45 degrees so that it makes it uh, easy for you to present the tool. The square bar has the advantage that it can't roll on the tool rest when you're uh, going in the extreme depths when you're hollowing. Uh, makes it a bit more secure. We're not going to get off that easy. It is a new toy after all. So I strapped it now to uh, the Simon Hope carbide and we can see what that looks like when it's presented to the work. Again, I'm only taking light cuts all the way through. I don't want to do anything too aggressive. Uh, just want to do it nice and safe and steady. And do clear out the mess regularly. My patented high-tech uh, clag clearing device from a coat hanger and a bit of gaffer tape is an exceptionally important tool to make. Hollowing isn't really a spectator sport uh, because there's not much to see to be honest so I thought I'd try all my different tools and give it a whirl. This is the woodcut uh, one which I'm not too sure about. Sometimes I have uh, really good uh, results and sometimes I, I struggle. Today I'm struggling. The shielded cutter seems to be clagging very easily with the soft wet wood. Um, I've had some really good results with it with a slightly more open form but today I just couldn't get on with it. It kept on clagging up so I uh, decided not to bother with this one today. So I've swapped to the uh, crown uh, articulating uh, tipped um, shielded uh, cutter which is high speed steel and I do find that this works quite well uh, generally for me uh, even more consistently than the carbides. It, it clears the wet shavings very well. So I thought now I'd uh, put my uh, alternative tool rest on which is the uh, Phil Irons one um, so called uh, for the uh, woodcut system but it can be used for any uh, tool. Um, it comes with the two U-shaped um, uh, rests that you can fit in different positions on that tool rest uh, located using the circlip um, and uh, the collar uh, means that it, you can set the height of the platform so that the tool is always at dead centre and uh, what it allows you to do is to lever against the uh, side of that hoop so that you um, take some of the load off your own arms when you're doing it and certainly makes it a uh, more robust cut that you can achieve. So I'm starting to remove a reasonable amount of material now uh, and you do need to use the patented sawdust clearing tool at regular intervals of course and basically it's a case of rinse and repeat now. You don't think you got off that easy, do you? So here's another shot now with it strapped to the crown tool uh, using the endoscope um, just to see what that looks like when you go inside. Again, uh, just taking uh, gentle cuts to start with because uh, obviously you're not going to see very much once the shavings start coming off. As you can get the idea there is indeed the case. And with the sawdust removed, you can see you're getting really quite a good finish on the inside there, uh, straight off the tool with um, the shear scraping action giving you a really good finish. Still got some detailing at the bottom to sort out because you can see the edge where the forstner was. So rinse and repeat really, uh, just uh, occasionally move the tool rest in order to get the um, tool presented at the best angle and uh, carry on hogging away. There's about 40 50 mil of wood to be removed so there was quite a bit of time spent doing this. So after I got quite a lot of it out um, I needed to just uh, finesse some of the finish at the bottom so I've just popped a small scraper on the uh, crown midi system which is the handle tool uh, just to sort of start um, detailing the bottom.
And this is where actually having the camera uh, for the inside proves quite useful because you can actually get in there and see what the finish is like. Not so easy just holding a torch into it because you can't get your eyeball in there to see what's going on. Still need a bit of work at the bottom, but we're getting there. So I decided to go back to the uh, ring scraper just to try and uh, cut a little bit more out of the bottom. Trying to get rid of that bottom hole, that uh, pip or dimple from the Forstner. Proving a bit of a challenge, trying to get something to just take a good cut across the bottom. But the um, shielded high speed steel cutter uh, with a bit of a wiggle side to side seems to get most of it out. Or at least that's what you think when you look at it from the top. But get that endoscope in there and you can still see there's some marks at the bottom. So just a few more tweaks with the same uh, tool uh, and then it's time to sand. And uh, now I'm going to put some sealer on the outside um, because it is so punky before I try and do anything else with it. Uh, I'm going to leave it at this stage and then uh, come back to it. Um, at a later date to return it after it's dried out.